So the Ferrari SF1000, perhaps the most eagerly awaited of all of the new Formula One cars, because it was the Ferrari, wasn't it, that came closest of all, that had the biggest opportunity to take down the might of Mercedes last year, and yet they failed. They failed for a number of reasons, both technical to do with their car, but also operational, too many mistakes, yada, 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 you know the story. So this year, could this be the one that takes them across the line, that finally tumbles Mercedes from the top of their tower? Well, it's definitely an evolution from last year, but that's typical across the board, I suspect, this year, uh, given that we've got this very stable set of regulations. Everybody looking to fine-tune the details of last year's car, hone the things they did well, address the problems that they might have had. And that's what Ferrari have tried to do with this thing. I mean, looking from the side view, you can still see that it still has this reasonably high rake angle, so a much bigger gap at the rear. You can see all this daylight underneath. Uh, I talked about it in yesterday's video around the, the new Haas VF20, similar kind of take on it. Um, but there are a few more details around this that Ferrari kind of had last year, but they've really doubled down and gone big this year. Lots of nice detail around the side pod area, the barge pod area and the side pod area. We'll go into that in a moment. Uh, front wing has some changes as well, perhaps some unexpected changes. So we'll look at a bit more depth from some other angles. There's quite a lot to see on this car. Okay, let's start at the front end because the front wing was perhaps one of the areas that I expected to see a big change on this Ferrari from what they had last year. And yet, well, they have made a change, but it's not really in the direction that I thought they were gonna go. They were one of the teams last year, weren't they? Along with a few others, Alfa Romeo and others, who had this very, very extreme version of the outboard end of their front wing flaps, tailoring away, or tapering away rather, to be completely unloaded. There's almost nothing there at the outboard end, is there? And that's really all about creating this outwash effect where the front uh, airflow flows up the front wing flaps and is then directed to the outboard edge of those flaps and through the gap between the front wing end plate and the tire as the end plate curves out as well. We've even got a little cutout on the end of the end plate there to help that process. It's all about throwing the airflow in this big outward trajectory out here as fast as they can, as high energy as they can. And we know, I've talked about this many times, that's about dragging with it the messy airflow that spirals off the back of these tires that are rotating and bouncing and turning through steering angles, creating a horrible aerodynamic mess in this area here, which if left unchecked, would start to interfere with this really crucial area around the underside of the floor and the back of the, the Coke bottle area where much of the downforce of the, of the car really comes from. So if we don't deal with this mess, that is really negatively affected everything else rearwards of it. So what we do, or what Ferrari are doing, is creating a huge outwash effect by putting a powerful, turbulent, uh, sorry, vortex stream running off this front wing and this outward trajectory, pulling with it a lot of this mess to try and take away the problem of having to deal with that mess further down the car. By throwing it outboard of the car, we as a, as a designer of a Formula One car no longer have to deal with it. It kind of becomes someone else's problem. That's another story because that's part of the issue of trying to have cars follow each other, but that's a whole other story. That's the concept they've gone for here. But what they've done this year, instead of trying to rein it back in, because potentially what a lot of people thought last year was this concept on the Ferrari Although it made it very low drag, there's much less surface area. It's only the inboard section of this wing that is creating the downforce and therefore the drag that comes along with that. So actually, much less so than something like a Mercedes, we've got a far lower drag coefficient on this front wing than some of the other cars. Red Bull, Mercedes are, are obvious examples. Now, along with that low drag of this particular setup, of course, comes a limited amount of downforce production. So if the front end can't produce enough downforce, at some circuits that's absolutely fine. We saw this incredible top end speed of the Ferrari at many tracks around the world. But when they needed to balance the aerodynamics, when they needed to balance the car through perhaps creating a bit more front end downforce, they came up against a limit. They were, they were front end limited in terms of how much downforce they could actually create with this particular setup. So a lot of people thought, well, maybe what they'll do is they'll swing back towards the Mercedes or the Red Bull type setup, where you actually maximize this area for downforce production. But they haven't done that. They haven't gone that way. What they've done, and I quite like this about the fact that they've gone this way, they've stuck with what they think they know. 
and they've not only stuck with it but they've got even more extreme in terms of tapering away those outboard ends. So very very low drag, it will be limited in the amount of downforce that it's been able to create but I think in other areas of the car they think, I imagine, that they've managed to compensate for that and still be able to produce a well-balanced car for most racetracks. Only time will tell, but I really like the fact that they have gone more and more extreme and this is a different solution to we're going to see on some other cars up and down the grid. Bear in mind, of course, this may not and is highly unlikely to be the solution we'll see in Australia, maybe not even the solution we'll see in Barcelona. So entirely possible at some stage throughout pre-season testing we see Ferrari coming with a much higher downforce option just to give that a go perhaps. Now at the nose cone we've got uh, a very similar setup to last year, in fact a very similar setup to the Haas VF20 as well. Uh, there's a cape uh, underneath under here collecting and directing a lot of the airflow coming through this central section. Uh, a thumb tip on the nose, two little splitters on either side of that nose uh, all helping to push the airflow through this channel underneath the nose where it's then collected and tidied up by this big section of serrated uh, elements underneath the nose itself. This section under front, on the front of the front uh, wing and in front of the nose, we call it the Y250 section. It's an area that the regulations stipulate 250 millimetres either side of the Y axis. That's why it's called the Y250 zone. Um, it has to be a neutral zone on the wing, so you can't put flaps and flick ups and, and winglets on there. That has to be a non downforce producing part of the front wing. For that very reason, then, there's a huge amount of airflow throwing, flowing through here, but it's not controlled airflow. There's no aerodynamic devices to get it under control, so that's where the work starts through here. From this cape, you can see how it flows through the two elements, connect to each other almost, the airflow passing through the middle. These serrated elements energising it by putting vortexes or vortices rather into that flow and then directing it. Some of it channeling down towards the underside of the, of the floor of the car, others cleaning it up and pushing it round towards this complicated barge board section as well. But a lot of work gone into this area and we'll move back further, for, further rearwards in a moment. Um, top wishbone and track rod have been separated uh, again like the Haas, like we saw on the Haas. Uh, into two elements rather than one aerodynamic shroud. There may be some very small aerodynamic gain in having two separate surfaces with a slot uh, down the middle for that and I presume that's that's the reason they've gone for it. Uh, what's now a standard S-duct at the top here, so collecting up some of this um, unenergized, uncontrolled air from underneath the nose and kind of ejecting it comes through an S-shaped duct in the nose cone itself ejecting it out of the top where it's less harmful uh, than it would be if it was left unchecked down here. Uh, you can see at the wing mirrors we've got some nice detail, some little flaps uh, or shrouds around what would otherwise be a fairly typical standard uh, wing mirror element but we've actually got this nice aerodynamic piece linked up to the horizontal flap coming out of the side of the chassis over the top of the, uh, the side pod intake. So nice work, nice detailed work there. Again, all about trying to control and clean up the airflow towards the rear of the car. Um, the side pod inlets are also different this year. Uh, they look to me a little bit bigger, certainly a different shape, and they have this really big horizontal plane across here, which is shaped and curved, points downwards and actually tips downwards, which is very obviously to really push as much of this airflow being worked by these barge balls and deflectors through here, pushed it down here through to around, around towards the rear of the car. We don't have a, a very obvious undercut like we've had on previous cars uh, around the side pod. When you have an undercut it gives you a natural channel for that airflow to follow as it goes around here because we haven't got that so much now because they've shrunk down the rear bodywork so much. This element here He's trying to do some of that job, it's to give it a bit of an undercut, to give it some shape and to almost create a tunnel like effect to push that airflow around here because as the airflow follows around the edge of this floor and around the edge of the side pod it's then heading in towards what we call the coke bottle area and above the back of the diffuser where it really has worked really hard, crucial to producing a load of downforce in that area. So some nice work around here, these are ever so complicated, ever so detailed, a couple of horizontal boomerang pieces here uh, and these are interesting because they've split this into three separate elements rising up higher than all the rest 
There's a tiny loophole in the regulations that gives you a tiny area very close to the chassis in which you're allowed to uh, place a piece of bodywork at that height. The actual regulations were written with the intention of keeping these barge boards down to this kind of height here. But there's a little area that you're allowed in this zone here, very close, as I say, to the chassis itself, where you're allowed to put something. And they've taken advantage of that uh, with this complex arrangement here of serrated barge boards. It's, very, it's beautiful to look at, it's a work of art. Uh, it'll be a constant area of development as this season goes on as well, as it was last year, I'm sure. Looking up at the, uh, the roll hoop, we can see that we've got the triangular intake here, again, like the Haas that we saw the other day, with a uh, split down the middle. Um, again, these are going to be different channels for different cooling and, of course, the internal combustion engine intake as well. Um, what's underneath the bodywork, we don't really know, but what they have managed to do, very much like the Red Bull, like Adrian Newey's Red Bull, is shrink in the back end to extreme levels. There's just literally nothing here. You can imagine underneath there, it's so tightly packed. Um, I hope they've got cooling uh, calculations correct because that's one of the downsides of shrinking in your bodywork that much, shrink wrapping it around all the components like radiators and electronics. You leave almost no room for airflow to keep those components cool. So I mean, I'm sure they've thought of it, but, uh, but that's a really nice uh, packaging detail that they've got going on around there. Here's another zoomed in view from the side where you really get a nice picture of this real intense detail around the side pod. And look also at the height they've managed to achieve with the chassis itself. All of this clear flow, clear air underneath here that's uninterrupted is about channeling as much airflow through this part of the floor. If you look at the rake angle of the car, this is the lowest point on the entire floor section. And therefore, that's where the airflow has been squeezed most through that tiny gap. And therefore, the airflow is going fastest and is at its lowest pressure. So that is the point where most downforce is being created. It's the lowest pressure zone on the floor where the car is being pulled down towards the racetrack by, or actually pushed down by the higher pressure airflow above it, being pulling the, the car down towards the tarmac and therefore generating grip. It's a really nice visual, really nice view of that. Moving further back, they've also added these little uh, horns or winglets on the side of the, uh, the roll hoop. Uh, we had them at McLaren in a more extreme version years ago. We used to call them Helga's horns because they look like a Viking helmet. Um, but they are there to clean up the airflow that's coming off the cockpit area, which is a horribly messy area because, of course, you've got the driver's helmet turning and moving around. You've got the steering and the driver's hands turning into that airflow stream as well. You've got the halo. It's a really difficult area to control. Some of the airflow, of course, goes into this air intake, but the rest of it you want to continue on to the important areas like the rear wing. And so having a little couple of elements there are just helpful to be able to add some control to that flow, maybe keep it attached, add some energy to it by putting a vortex, a vortex in it, keeping it attached uh, to the bodywork. This detail has changed as well on this, uh, this shark fin, but I think that's fairly going to be fairly common and fairly typical amongst the field as it, we've seen in, in other cars already. Um, some nice work along the edge of the floor. Again, I don't want to go into too much detail because that will be constantly developing and changing as well. But lots of slots and flick ups to control things like uh, the tyre squirt. Uh, that's the term that we call the, uh, the airflow that squirts out uh, at the point where the, the rotating tyre makes contact with the tarmac. We don't want it disappearing into the floor and interrupting this expanding gap with this high rake that's being used to generate more and more downforce to exacerbate the effect of the diffuser. If you get airflow, high pressure airflow spilling over and underneath the floor, you start to lose the impact of that. So a lot of work goes into this floor edge to try and seal this gap aerodynamically. In the old days, of course, we had those side skirts, didn't we, back in the 70s, to do that very job much more effectively. We can't do that now, so we try and do it using aerodynamics and all the tools and little pieces and elements that we have along the side of the car to try and do that job for us. It's a really interesting car, this. A lot of detail. The Ferrari have said that they have maximised, they've gone extreme on everything. And I really love that. They're, they're coming out fighting. Ferrari. The talk is all aggressive fighting talk and I really want to see that from somebody like Ferrari. I hope that they can not only get the details of this thing right and prove that it works on the racetrack but I really hope that they can get their operations right, that the drivers can make fewer mistakes, they get their strategy right because it's going to take all of those things along with a good car if they're really going to have, have any chance of toppling Mercedes.